In this section, we're going to look at polynomial functions, which a quadratic function, which we looked at in 2.1, is also a polynomial. Uh, but we're going to expand out a little bit more and look at a more general approach, not just limited to quadratic functions, uh, functions of different powers. Um, in fact, when we talk about polynomials, um, <clears throat> it's kind of one of those things that's easier to see than it is to uh, define, but we'll try to put like a definition on, uh, on a polynomial. So we say that a polynomial function of degree n, uh, n being the highest power that you see within the polynomial, is a function of the form, and then we have some real sort of uh, abstract uh, things here where we have a sub n x to the n. And so when we say a sub n, that's just marking this particular a value to this particular uh, um, variable x raised to that power. <clears throat> so when we say a to the n, or a sub n, we're talking about n as being a non-negative integer, and the a's are really just the coefficients, so the number's out front. So with a sub n, we're really just tagging that particular number for that particular uh, term. And then we have them going in descending order. So a sub n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, all the way down to a sub 1, x, and then a sub 0. a sub 0 would just be the constant by itself with no more x's. If you wanted to put the x in there, it would be x to the this is 1, should so be 1 less than that, x to the 0, and x to the 0 is just 1, so really that just leaves us with the coefficient a sub 0. Notice that we also say that a sub n can't equal 0. Well, a sub n is the coefficient of the very first term, and if a sub n was the value 0, then that would eliminate this value, and then no longer would it be an nth degree polynomial right, because that term would be eliminated. Uh, so that's why we have to say that a sub n uh, cannot equal zero. All right, some terms we like to throw out there in relation to polynomials. The term that has the highest degree, right, the x to the n, if this is an nth degree polynomial, we call that the leading term. Um, so if it's an x to the third, Whatever that coefficient is in front of it, x to the third would be our leading term. And then whatever that value a sub n is, we would call also the leading coefficient. And the last one that we saw, the a sub zero, right? That was the one at the very end. We call that the constant term. In fact, any term that is just a number by itself with no variable, that's what we would call a constant term, right? You have variables, which their values vary depending on what we put into the x, but then you have the constant term, which is always that value. So the term itself does not change value. And <clears throat> just a, re a reminder as well, each of those little parts, like this was our first leading term, all those small products, like right, 2x squared or 3 x to the first, those are products. Uh, sometimes they're expressed also as uh, divisions, like one half uh, x to the n. But those are all what we call terms. Terms are products, and they're separated by pluses and minuses. So each one of those is called a term. And of course, we have like terms that we can add together, but the term is basically a small product of numbers or variables, or numbers by themselves or variables by themselves. All right, and um, so if we just have that const, that function set equal to the constant a, a sub zero, where a is not zero, because if a was zero, we would have, well, just the vertical axis, really. I'm sorry, the horizontal axis, which may be written as f sub x a x to the zero is a polynomial of degree zero. So if we have f of x just equal to a number, we say the degree of that is zero, just like I was showing you previously, because you can write that just constant by itself with a variable, 
but that variable would be to the zero power, which is why we just see the number. Um, x to, or anything to the zero power, is equal to one. So if we have a x to the zero, that's the same as a times one, which is simply a. <clears throat> Uh, the zero function f of x equal to zero has no degree assigned to it. All right. That's just maybe a little piece of trivia <laughs> that you might use at some point. And then polynomials of degree three, four, and five. Uh, of course, if it was a degree two, we would call it a quadratic, but a degree three, we call it cubic, degree four, a quartic, and degree five, a quintic polynomial but you can also just call them polynomials. That covers pretty much anything. So what are some common properties that we see? What are some properties that carry on from one polynomial to a different, whether they're uh, a degree, one, you know, a, a cubic or a quartic? Uh, you know, what are some of those things that we see that make a polynomial function? What are their connections? Uh, the first thing is that the domain of a polynomial is a set of all real numbers. So we don't have any restrictions on our domains. That's why you've seen for most quadratic equations, which, as you know, are a parabola, that their uh, domain is negative infinity to positive infinity, the set of all real numbers. Also, number two, one of the other characteristics that's common with all polynomials is that the graph of the polynomial is continuous and smooth. So we don't have any gaps like what we see here, uh, which we would probably get with more of a piecewise function, as we saw a couple sections ago. Or you'll notice here we have a hole. There are times where uh, we get those. I'm not going to get into how they happen, but... Basically, it's a point where this particular value is excluded uh, from the domain. And also, we don't run into these weird sharp corners, uh, which, again, you would see these type of things uh, more with a... So, like, this would be a piecewise function where we have some gaps, some jumps, uh, as we move from one uh, equation to another equation. Um, this also would be the similar thing. We have a parabola, and then it turns into a different one, and so forth and so on. So given those two properties that we looked at, um, this can help us determine whether we're actually dealing with a technical, as-defined polynomial function, or whether we're not. Um, so here, we're given some functions. We want to determine if they are polynomial. And for each polynomial to find its degree, so the degree of the function, the leading term, and then the leading coefficient. So looking at a, uh, we have f of x equal to 5x to the fourth minus 2x plus 7. So my uh, degree of the function being the highest power that we see, this is a fourth degree function. The leading term is the highest term or the highest degree term, and this is a fourth degree term. And then the leading coefficient there would be 5. Um, yeah. For B, uh, 7x squared minus x plus 1, where x is between 5 and 1, um, this would not be a uh, polynomial function. Only reason is because we've limited the domain. The domain is limited between 1 and 5, so it's no longer a polynomial in the strictest definition of a polynomial. The C, um, because, because of the domain, not going from negative infinity to positive infinity. Otherwise, this would be, and it would be a second degree, this would be the leading term, and seven would be the leading coefficient, if this part was not there. For C, H of X, eight X squared minus three X plus two X to the one half, this looks like it should be a polynomial, but let's go back and just look at it. Um, first of all here. Um, so set is, is all real numbers, um, and the graph is a continuous or smooth curve. So when I look at the first thing where it said set of real numbers, keeping in mind what a 
fractional power is. Uh, fractional power is a square root. And so for x, with this x to the one half actually being equivalent to two times the square root of x, we now have to limit our domain for x because we can't have negative numbers being plugged in for x. So x would have to be all numbers greater than or equal to zero. So because of that, this is also not a polynomial function, which carries over also to what we see here in D, um, because we have a denominator here, um, the, set of all, uh, the set of allowed plugins for our domain um, does not include three halves, positive three over two, because positive three over two would give us a zero in the denominator. So we do not have a domain that goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. So therefore, this would also not be a polynomial function. In looking at the behavior of polynomial functions, it's actually helpful for us to strip back the excessive number of terms we sometimes have within a polynomial and to look at the behavior of what I would call maybe their parent, uh, parent term um, because every polynomial of the same degree will have some similar characteristics. So at any rate, um, we're going to call the sort of stripped back version of these polynomials the power function because really we're looking at the behavior for that particular power uh, in its most simplest form. So uh, we say if a function of the form f of x equal to a x to the n is called a power function of degree n, so whatever the highest power is there, right? Or if you have one term, it's going to be the only power. But regardless, uh, a is going to be a non-zero number, real number, so it can be positive, negative, decimals, fractions, what have you. But n, the power, has to be a positive integer. Again, another reason why that x to the one-half was not a uh, polynomial was because it was not an integer. An integer is a positive or negative uh, whole number. And in this case, we allow n to only be positive integers. And then we can take our power function and break them into the behavior of even and odd power functions. And we did already talk about whether, you know, what makes something an even function, or at least we looked at uh, the test that we had uh, to determine whether we had an even function or not. And so if we have our power function here and n, the power, is even, then if I take the nth power of a negative x, it's going to be always become positive, right? Anything raised to an even power, uh, all the negatives cancel themselves out. And so we end up something that's equivalent to if it was a positive x. So uh, f of negative x is a times negative x to the n, which we know stays positive because of the even power that we have, uh, equal to our function. So in other words, plugging in a negative x doesn't change the outcome uh, of the y. It remains the same as if we had had a positive x. When we have that being the case, uh, this graph will always be symmetric with respect to the y-axis. So that doesn't mean every um, even function is always symmetric to the y-axis. It simply means uh, power functions of this form. Uh, where you have a x to the n with no other terms. And as long as that negative x gives me the same uh, as what a positive x would, we should see symmetry with respect to the y-axis. And the graph y equal to x to the n, x being even, is similar to the graph of y equal to x squared, <coughs> which we know y equal to x squared gives us that parabola. What we see is always very similar to a parabola when it's just y or f of x equal to x to the n power, whether that n is a 2 or x to the 4th, x to the 6th. Any even number gives us somewhat of a similar graph with some differences, obviously. With odd degrees, we, we saw almost really the opposite here. So we have our, our power function where, and in this case is odd, any 
negative number raised to the nth power results in the opposite uh, x to the n, so the negative x to the n, um, which before didn't change anything. As we saw with odd functions, they're symmetric with respect to the origin, and the graph of y equal x to the n and being odd is similar to the graph of y equal to x cubed. Again, there's a lot of similarities, but then we'll see slight differences in them as well. Because all of the um, even-powered, even functions, uh, even polynomials, are similar to, to the sort of parent function y equal to x squared, we want to look at the patterns we see. And specifically what we want to look at is how do the graphs behave as x, right, x being along here, approaches negative infinity, what are we seeing with the y outcomes? This can get a little confusion, uh, I'm sorry, confusing, but we want to look at as x goes to the right, uh, what we're seeing with the y values. So here we can see as x moves to the right that y is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, going higher and higher and higher. And as x goes toward negative infinity, right, negative infinity is in this direction, but remember the y outcomes are graphed along here. So as we move to the left, my y values are going up, up, up to positive infinity. So y equal to f of x, so my y's, as they approach, they will approach infinity as x approaches positive and x approaches negative infinity. You'll notice that they're both approaching a positive infinity on the right-hand side and the left-hand side. That, of course, is true with uh, quadratics, again, x to the, to the second, where the number out in front on the previous one was positive. I'll go back there real quick. Positive, greater than zero. But when we have negative, so A is a negative value, we see the opposite. And we, we saw we had that reflection across the, the x-axis there. Um, so when we look at y equal to negative x squared, again, the pattern for every even power should follow a similar power. Um, but as x approaches negative infinity, y will approach negative infinity as well. Uh, on both sides. With odd functions or odd polynomial degrees um, where a is greater than zero, um, as we move to the left for x, what we see y moving toward is a negative infinity. Um, remember that uh, as we go you know, from here to the left, these are all negative inputs, right? And with the odd polynomial, negative inputs led to negative outputs. So negative x's led to negative y's. Um, and that's going to be the case with all powers that are odd when a is a positive number. So on the left-hand side, we see our y values approaching negative infinity. On the right-hand side, uh, as x approaches positive infinity, y approaches positive infinity as well. And that's what we see as the pattern for odd polynomials where A is positive. But if we go A being negative, <clears throat> it changes uh, specifically Y equal to negative X to the third. So a negative input stays negative when we raise it to the third power, but then the negative out front changes it to a positive, right? So the negative input of x gets raised to the third power, remains negative because of the even power, or the odd power. And then, then when we th think of a negative in front of a variable, we think of the opposite sign. So that negative output, we take the opposite sign, becomes positive. So on the, on the, on the negative side for x, we see a positive increase towards infinity. And on the right-hand side, before we were seeing a positive direction toward infinity. Here we have a negative approach uh, to infinity as x becomes positive. So basically this is reflected across the x-axis, just like we saw with parabolas. So when we look at just general polynomials and we want to look at their end behavior, the end behavior really is what we can say always matching up to whatever the 
sort of parent polynomial power function behavior is. Um, and so just taking a look at an example, we can kind of show why mathematically this will generally be the case that we can uh, depend on. So we just take a third degree polynomial, uh, this being my leading term, leading coefficient being two, um, <clears throat> and we want to show that, or we want to explore what the uh, behavior is for this. Um, as far as, as we go from negative, or we go out to negative infinity, and we go out to positive infinity on the other side, um, I can take the function here, p of x, uh, or f there, but p of x, 2x cubed plus 5x squared minus 7x plus 11. And I'm just going to take, <coughs> excuse me, this, and I'm going to factor out the leading term or just the variable with that term. So factor out the x cubed. Now, typically we wouldn't factor this out um, because it's not common and we don't like to create denominators where we don't need them. But in this case, it actually helps us to see the behavior here in the relationship. If I take out x cubed, that's this term when every factor we're dividing, so we're dividing that by x cubed, that just leaves me with 2. For the next one, if I factor out x cubed, um, that's one more x than I have, so I end up with 5 over x, <clears throat> or uh, the other way you can think of that is 5x to the minus 1, which also would, you know, move that down to the denominator. You can also see that if I redistributed it, one of the x's would cancel, leaving me with x squared. Okay. And then this would be 7 over x squared, and then we have plus 11 over x cubed. Now, why would I do this? Well, there's only one reason I'm really doing this here. And that's to examine the behavior. Um, so if I think about what happens as x gets larger and larger, so we can think of x as being like 100 or 1,000. Um, that would make this particular part of this sum and difference statement to, well, first of all, it doesn't affect 2 at all, right? Uh, plugging in a 100 or 1,000, something big for x, doesn't really affect the 2 because 2 is a constant by itself at this point. But 5 over 100 is point, point 0.5, or 5 over 1,000 is point zero 0.05. And then 7 over that 100 or that 1,000 squared plus 11 over that 100 or 1,000 raised to the third power. These all become fractions where the denominators are super large, and the larger they get, you know, as x approaches infinity, the smaller the values these become. So these become, these approach zero, really. As x gets larger and larger, this becomes close to zero, close to zero, close to zero. And so I'm really just left with two. And so what we should see the behavior of this polynomial uh, emulate is a 2x to the cube behavior. It's going to be, and that's, that's in the extreme ends for this polynomial, not necessarily in the, the, the x values that aren't very large. Uh, we'll see a lot more fluctuation with those. <coughs> so with, you know, 2 being a, our a value, right, our leading coefficient, and x cubed, we'd expect the long-term effects of this be similar to uh, the behavior of <clears throat> a 2x cubed function, which 2x cubed functions, you know, look like this. But we're not really sure what's going to happen in the smaller values uh, for x. So x's that are around 0, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, 2, 3, etc. Um, this is kind of hidden to us. We don't know what's going to happen there. But I do know that the n functions, as x approaches negative infinity, this will approach negative infinity as well for y, and as x approaches positive infinity for x, our y will approach positive infinity as well. So that leading term, the highest degree term within the polynomial, um, <clears throat> is our guide to at least the long-term behavior of 
the function. Uh, so given any kind of function where um, it's raised to the nth degree, and so we call that the leading term, the behavior of the graph as, of f, so the behavior as of y, as x approaches infinity and or as y approaches negative infinity should be similar to one of the four graphs that we, or the two that were well, the four that we've looked at uh, with a negative a and a positive a, um, and for each case. The middle portion of the graph it's not really determined by this test. In other words, it's hard for us to know. It's very, there's so many variables as to what happens in the middle. But overall, you're going to see that similarity. So in a, uh, the first case where we had an even power and n was greater than zero, so n was positive, we had the, you know, the, the graph we're always kind of comparing it to is that parabola graph where as we approach negative infinity, x becomes larger, approaches positive infinity, same on the right-hand side. In the middle, we're not exactly sure what's going to happen. So this is written with dotted lines, varies from polynomial to polynomial, but the end behaviors are similar. When a is negative, similar idea, we would have that upside down parabola, but depending on a lot of different things, for even, all we know is that the leading term has a po uh, even power, uh, the behaviors as x approaches negative infinity will be negative infinity for y, same on the other side as x approaches positive infinity. Case three was when we had positive a, so a positive uh, leading coefficient value, um, and so we had that x cubed, right? So uh, it's an odd function. As x approaches negative infinity, we have something going down. Uh, as x approaches positive infinity, something going up. And if that leading term is negative, so it's less than zero, it flips around, right? So as x approaches negative infinity, we're getting larger and larger wise. x approaches positive infinity, uh, lesser and more negative wise. All right, so using that leading term, um, <clears throat> we see here we have um, x to the third power. This is my highest power. Always look for the highest power. Doesn't this is um, there's nothing saying that we have to put them in descending orders. We tend to, but we always want to look through and make sure that they've actually done that because technically you don't have to have that. You still want to look for what the leading uh, or the highest power is to determine what your leading term is. Um, but it's also a negative a that we have out here. And so those two things combine together with a graph um, with a negative a. This is the x cubed, the general one. Again, not really sure what happens kind of in the middle there. <clears throat> so this is not really known. But as x approaches negative infinity we see y approaching positive infinity. y or f approaches uh, positive infinity. As x approaches positive infinity, we see that y is doing the opposite. It's going down, approaching negative infinity. <clears throat> this is simply using the graph of x cubed where the a value is a negative number. All right, so let's talk about what we mean by the zero of a polynomial function. Um, it's actually a term that we use that has many different sort of equivalent expressions um, that we've talked about in different, scenar uh, different uh, scenarios or uh, contexts. But if we have a polynomial f and c is a real number, so here we're talking about real zeros, uh, then the following statements would be equivalent. So in other words, we, uh, they mean the same thing. Uh, so we could say this c, if it exists, uh, and assuming here that they do exist, would be <clears throat> what we call a zero of f. You can also call that zero of f a solution or root of the equation where f of x is equal to zero. So you can see here 
one of the reasons why we call it a zero is because it's the x value uh, that results in our y being zero. <clears throat> and of course, if y is zero, then that c is also referred to as an x-intercept. So really what we're talking about when we talk about real zeros are x-intercepts of the graph of f. The point C0 is on the graph of f. And then when you're talking about the function itself, uh, <clears throat> if C is a 0, if it's a solution, x-intercept, then x minus C would be one of the factors of f. So finding the zero of a polynomial, um, how do we go about doing that? Lots of different types of polynomials that we have. Um, let's start with maybe the first one we have here, f of x equal to x to the fourth minus 2x cubed minus 3x squared. <clears throat> um, as you know, finding the solutions, finding the roots, when we substitute out 4f of x, 0, um, isn't always the easiest thing in the world to do. And sometimes it can be really difficult uh, finding these. We're going to look at different strategies down the road here. Graphing them is actually a really helpful thing. Um, but without graphs at this point, how would we find the zeros, the solutions, the x values <clears throat> that result in zero? When we factor, we always, and that's what we want to do here. We want to try to find the factors of the polynomial. Um, how do we do that when it's an x to the fourth? First thing is always look for a common factor. These are going to be set up to be able to be factored for you for the most part here. So this is not the exhaustive way that you could use these different things to find the zeros of every single polynomial function out there. Uh, but for some um, certain ones that have certain types of roots, etc., definitely this is a these are some methods you can use. So in other words, I look through here and I see that every one of these terms has at least two x's. So I'm going to pull that x squared out of here. And in doing so, that leaves me with something that's a little more, <clears throat> a little closer to what I'm used to seeing. Uh, a quadratic, which usually I know, uh, or many times, can be factored further. And we assume that in this case, not using the more difficult ways of like the quadratic formula and such, we can find the roots here. It's a negative three. So I know that I have to have a positive and a negative number and a negative sum. So the factors of three are one and three. Those are the only ones. And with different signs, they would have a difference of zero uh, of negative two. If I put the three with the negative and one with the positive, one uh, X plus negative 3x gives me minus 2x. <clears throat> so, you know, looking at sort of foil in reverse, x times x is x squared, and then x times minus 3 is minus 3x plus the other x term, 1x, gives me the sum of negative 2, and then 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. All right. Well, that's, that's helpful to us. And... Um, so what does that tell me about the roots? Uh, well, I know that x will equal whatever uh, I could plug in for x, it'll give me 0. So if I plug in 0 here, that would give me 0 times whatever comes out of here times whatever comes out of here, which would result in 0. So 0 itself, when I've got a just a variable by itself outside of the parentheses, is a root uh, for this parenthesis, negative one is one of my roots, my zeros. And for the last one, we see that positive three minus three gives me zero. So three is also one of my roots. Let's take a look at B, see what it has to give us here. So uh, G of X equal to X to the third minus two X squared plus X uh, minus 2. <clears throat> With this one, um, a little bit tougher, 
because we don't have a greatest common factor. None of these have, well, the last term here, this minus 2, doesn't have an x with it, so I can't really factor out an x. One of the tricks that we've used in the past is to factor by grouping. Because if I break this into smaller groups, now just putting parentheses here, this doesn't turn this into a statement of multipli uh, multiplication because I still have this plus here. So it's still a uh, overall statement of summation, these first two added to the last two. <clears throat> but in the first parenthesis, I see I have a common factor of x squared. So I can, if I factor that out, I'm only doing so hoping that I might see something like I am seeing here, uh, which is a similar binomial to what is on the other side of the plus sign there, which is x minus 2. So I have an x minus 2 here and here. <clears throat> so I can see that x minus 2 on either side of that plus is a common overall factor which that, it's a little hard to see, but it's something I can factor out. <clears throat> In other words, I take it out from both sides there, and I'm taking my plus, and I'm writing the plus here, right? And I write what's left on the left-hand side of the plus, which is x squared if I take out x squared. And on the right of the plus sign, I have a 1. <clears throat> which is what's left if I take x minus 2 and divide it by itself or factor it out, right? So picture, picture this, if this helps you to see what I did. If we take x minus 2 and I distribute it to x squared and distribute it to 1, we have what we have here. Basically, x squared times x minus 2 plus 1 times x minus 2. And now this is actually completely factored, uh, where it's a statement of multiplication. And I see that for this, x, we have two solutions, x equal to 2 for the first one. We can see that 2 would give me 0 in there. And then for the second one, x squared plus 1, let's see what that would have to be in order to get 0. If I subtract 1 on both sides, that's x squared is equal to negative 1. And then taking the square root of both sides, I see I end up with a problem. I have to take the square root of something negative, and that doesn't work. So um, <clears throat> in this case, there's only one real root or one real zero, and that is two. Um, the other root here is not a real number. Uh, down the road, we're going to look at the fact that it is a solution, it's just what we would call an, a couple of imaginary solutions, but they're not real solutions. And by real, I mean not real versus fake. I mean real as in it belongs to the real number set of numbers, which the real, the real set of numbers is numbers that we're used uh, to dealing with, basically. Every type of number that... Um, yeah, that shows up on a regular coordinate plane. So what we saw on the previous is that for both of these, um, the number of solutions I ended up with, here I had three real distinct solutions. Here I actually only had one real distinct solution. Um, but if we compare those to the degrees, this is a fourth degree equation, this is a third degree equation, um, the number of distinct real solutions that I had was less than that, there were three, main reason being is that this zero is from that x squared, so in reality, uh, zero is a solution twice. Um, so it's not distinct, but technically it's, it's a solution twice, uh, because your number of solutions uh, if we're looking at real and imaginary solutions, are always equal to the degree of your function. Here I ended up with one real uh, distinct solution. The other two were imaginary, but that does give us kind of a rule. Like, the degree of your function is the upper limit of real distinct solutions that you can have. 
And so uh, the real zeros of a polynomial function, we say the polynomial function of degree n with real coefficients has at most n real zeros or n real solutions. Uh, so n ends up being the uppermost number of solutions or zeros that you can have. And many times there's fewer because they're repeating themselves, like we had two zeros there, or some of them might be complex or imaginary. So looking at a polynomial that's already factored, uh, we've got three of them here, but looking at, let's just start with A, um, I have three real distinct uh, solutions or zeros. Positive one is one of them because one minus one is zero. Negative two is one of them because negative two plus two is zero. And three is another one. Three minus three is zero. <clears throat> so three real distinct zeros for this polynomial of degree three. So this is one where the degree of the polynomial is also equal to the number of zeros that I have. Looking at g of x, uh, we have my zeros. If I put you know, zero in for g of x, and that was kind of the assumption here. We're looking at zero for f of x. Um, <clears throat> we see that negative one is one of my solutions. And um, then when we look at the other one, we have a similar situation as to what we had before. We've got uh, x squared plus 1, and that's going to give me the same as what we had before. x squared plus 1 equal to 0. We'd subtract 1, and quickly we notice that taking the square root of both sides is a problem because we end up with uh, numbers that are not real. And so 1 is my only solution, but that's okay. It's I'm sorry, negative 1 is, is my only solution there, um, and that's okay because we... We can only have up to three distinct real solutions. It's just that, in this case, negative one is my only real distinct solution. For h of x, uh, same thing. It's nice to have these factored already, as you see. But uh, three is one of the solutions. And in fact, three is a solution twice. Because x minus three squared is x minus three, x minus three. But we don't need to... Uh, list it twice, it's just one of my solutions. It happens to be a solution twice, but it's, it's one of my solutions. And negative one also is my solution. So there are two distinct real zeros for this one as well. When we say the word distinct, we are meaning unique, right? It's distinguishable from others. Uh, so that's why, that's how we're discerning between having two zero solutions or having two solutions or two zeros that are three, like on, on H of X, is the fact that I don't list them because I'm just concerned about finding uh, solutions that are unique and different than, than other solutions. Now, interesting enough, with those points that are, or those roots or zeros that are, uh, that occur multiple times, right, with that X, squared that we saw it was factored out one of the factors was zero then we we have the you know x i can't remember if it was plus three or minus three but it was squared so that number that root was a root twice um we call those multiplicities um however many they are occurring and so let me just read the definition here so if c is a zero of a polynomial function f of x and the corresponding factor x minus c occurs exactly m times when f of x is factored then c is called a zero or a solution of multiplicity uh, now um, what we saw are solutions that occurred twice uh, most of the time or they occurred once most of the time they're occurring once so uh, the multiplicity of, of any zero that only occurs once is going to be one but it could occur three times or five times, but regardless, if it's odd, we see something in the graph, depending on whether that power or the number of times that it occurs is either odd or even at that uh, zero value, x equal to c. Remember that these zeros are places along the x-axis, so they're x-intercepts. That was another one of our 
things that we saw back when we were talking about equivalent expressions, we called them zeros because they were where they're intersecting the x-axis. We called them solutions, but we could also call them x-intercepts. In the case of the of a odd multiplicity, then the graph is going to cross the x-axis at that point. Again, x-intercepts. If the m is even, so if they occur twice or four times or uh, something to that effect, then the graph of f will touch at that point. It'll touch the x-axis at that point, but it doesn't actually cross it. It just kind of bounces off of it. Uh, and so there's, there's one marking there. Let's take a look at a, of a graph that'll show that. If m being odd, so uh, a value c of 0 of, of c occurs once or three times, then the graph is going to look something like this. It's crossing at c. Uh, the graph is crossing the x-axis at that point. But if it's a, it's a square or a 4 or something like to that effect, it touches it at c, so it's still an intercept, but it kind of it is bouncing off of it, right? So it just touches at that point, and that's it. It doesn't actually cross uh, when we have an even multiplicity of a zero. So looking at an example here, if we find the zeros of this, I see that uh, x is going to be equal to zero, and in fact it's this represents x times x, or so has a multiplicity of zero, uh, 2. We have a 0 or a solution of negative 1 and a solution of 2. This is a multiplicity of 2 because there's two of them because of the squared. And both of these have a multiplicity of 1. So graphically, um, uh, this would be a fourth degree function and it's a positive. I'm not going to attempt to graph it because we don't really know what the graph looks like, but um, it would most likely look something like this. First of all, I know that with the fourth degree that my end stuff is going to go up in either direction, like a parabola, right? It would be like an x squared type of scenario. Uh, and I know also that it crosses at 2, and then, oops. So it crossed at 2. I'm going to back up a little bit here. So I was thinking 2 and 1, but it's actually negative 1. So I'm just going to erase that. I know that the graph is going to cross at 2. So I'll just saying that this is 2, and let's put negative 1 over here. And, of course, 0 is right here. Um, I know that it will hit at zero, so zero is another one, so something to this effect. Maybe this goes lower and then it comes over here, you know, I don't, I don't know. Again, this is kind of a mystery. We'd have to actually plot some points, but I do know that this occurs, and then it goes up through one also, or negative one, sorry. This is at negative one. So, and again, I don't know if this dips way down here, but we do know it crosses and then we know the end behavior. So we, we have some ideas, but notice at zero, um, it didn't cross. It just went in and then went back out, kind of like a small parabola there, right, would do at, a, at its vertex, um, and then turns around and has to cross at negative one as well. And so this is how we can begin to visualize how these uh, graphs are kind of put together. And we're going to look at more and more ways to get specific about these graphs. Of course, we can always just plot out points, but all the clues that we can get about my graph uh, help me to begin to visualize what it's going to look at, the end behavior of the graph, and then also the ways that it's going to interact with the x-axis.